yeah, I'll go through this quickly. So uh, this is item 4-3. Hopefully you guys all got that amended report that Donna mentioned this morning. And um, basically what this, what is this project that we gave money to Scott and the Prince William Sound Science Center to do for us? Uh, we gave them money so that Scott could fly around in a plane and map out juvenile forage fish in Prince William Sound. So that's what he did for us. And it's planned for a four year uh, project with the council. And uh, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll know that this is building on previous science in the sound. So we're kind of building out uh, biology data about herring and those other forage fish that we're looking for. Um, overall, the 2019 results, the herring uh, or schools in general were low in 2019 when uh, Scott flew around. And these um, important to the council, we have a duty to um, identify environmentally sensitive areas in Prince William Sound so that they can be planned for and protected during an oil spill. And that's kind of the nexus of this project for us is that you're identifying those areas where forage fish tend to hang out. And uh, you can imagine that data is useful in different ways. So the forage fish that Scott was looking for, uh, first off forage fish, small schooling, uh, not bottom fish on the surface or in the water column. And the ones that Scott was uh, looking for were Pacific uh, sand lance, herring, capelin, and candlefish. And I never heard uh, Ulicon before, but that's the, the more sciencey way to say it. Is that right? Hooligan? Hooligan? Yeah. And uh, I like candlefish. It's easier. There's a cool YouTube video where you can burn it. Um, it's got so much fat. Um, but anyways, I think we all know that they're important ecologically, they're important commercially, and they're directly and indirectly important at a recreational and subsistence level. They're part of uh, the food chain, right? Um, but the problem is they have tails. They're hard to track down, and Prince William Sound's really big. So uh, what's the challenge? Uh, to monitor these populations isn't easy. You can't just get uh, the, the census takers on the shoreline to figure it out. Um, and they're in nearshore environments, so like acoustic surveys sometimes don't work. So a great way to do that accurately is to hire Scott and some other expert scientists to fly around the sound. So there's a picture of Scott since he's not here. And um, is this the, so this is a picture of the track lines that they fly. The red is all where they fly around with a plane. So you can see they cover all of Prince William Sound in these aerial surveys. And uh, um, this year they didn't cover this uh, Copper River Delta and the Kayak Island, but they did pretty much the rest here. You can kind of ignore these other black lines because it was from another um, study. And Scott isn't just making this stuff up. He has a, a, a well-developed protocol that um, previous scientists developed in the sound in terms of, you know, following certain procedures and making sure that uh, what they're seeing from the air is actually what they're truly on the ground. And I think that this picture just tells a lot of what Scott is seeing from the air. Um, so methods wise, there's two people in an airplane flying at roughly a thousand feet, roughly, you know, try to get at the same speed. And uh, they go around looking for schools of forage fish here. You got sand lance and you have herring here. And they do this in June. The reason they do it in June is to avoid um, miscounting uh, younger fish like age zero herring or sand lance that were just born because they're focused on age one and age two herring, uh, juvenile fish. And then they're also looking for the sand lance, the um, hooligan and um, the other, the other one. And uh, so yeah, so they do it in June. They have a special sighting tube that they can tell school size. Um, they can identify by species. They can do that by kind of the, the color and the shape. The herring tend to ball up. Sand lance tend to have this kind of ir irregular shape to it. So these trained experts can tell from the air what's going on. Um, but you can't just take their word for it, so they don't. They, uh, they get some people on some boats to come out and take samples to make sure that Scott's not lying. And so they're really um, good at getting it accurate. On average, in the, in, in the historic um, science they did, they were about 80 to 95% accurate from the air, so that's pretty darn good. And Scott did really good this year. He was about 95% accurate based on the validation work that he did. So for the $40,000 that uh, we gave them, this is what you get is this little map. So I hope you think it's worth it. Um, the, this map shows all of Prince William Sound. And what the blue dots are is the age one herring. So you see a lot of blue dots all around. And these are showing school counts. So the bigger the circle, the more schools. And it's schools per you know, X kilometers. I think it's per two kilometers. But Scott could correct me if, if anybody cares to know that. Um, and then the, the yellow dots are the age two herring, so they're almost adults, almost able to spawn. And then uh, you have the sand lance in red around, uh, around like eaglet and stuff. 
And then you have capelin, which you really don't see any green dots. I don't think they saw uh, any capelin around. And uh, so there's that. And then uh, there weren't, weren't any hooligan that they reported, or maybe it was like one, and so they didn't show it. So um, this is what a low year looks like, believe it or not. There's tons of dots all over the, um, the sound, but based on historic work from 95 to 97 and through 2016, if you count up all the numbers of schools, this was relatively low. So that's a big take home message is 2019 was low. Um, and just to kind of give you some more understanding, like the age one herring, you can see tend to hang out inside the sound. Uh, they're younger, they're closer to where they uh, were born is, is what I understand. And then the age two herring, you can see are kind of all this, these yellow dots. They're all kind of towards the entrances because by June, the adult herring are either out feeding in the Gulf or somewhere else, they, they leave the party. Um, so that's kind of what's going on. And um, so, great, we have a map. Is this of use? Yeah, it's of use. So uh, from Scott's perspective, it's especially useful because if he's in charge of the herring monitoring program, and the working theory right now is all this age one herring data helps them predict what's gonna happen in the spawning class. So when, like two years from now, when these age one, if, so if, if the theory holds, if it's a low year this year, two years from now, the recruiting class would be low too. But Scott's trying to get enough data to make that model assumption actually valid. So that's one use of the data is for modeling the Prince William Sound herring population, which I know we all care about. Uh, from our perspective, you can see that it gives you a map of where, say, if there was an oil spill, you know, mid-sound, you might want to protect these uh, populations or these populations, depending on what the uh, oil spill modeling was telling you uh, based on the spill. And that's a key duty of ours. This um, is another take on that same information. This, is, this shows um, data from 2010 to 2016. So this is the previous data. So this doesn't include 2019. But these are all heat maps. Here you have all the forage fish schools on one map. Here you have sand lance. Here you have the age one herring. Here you have the age two herring. And basically where it's red and yellow, that's where, that's where you're seeing hot spots. So the sand lance really like the Dutch group and Eaglick. Um, H2 herring hanging out by Chiniga or even up in the Valdez Arm and by, Night, or, uh, by Glacier Island. And um, I think you can see how this would be useful because over time, these fish are moving around, right? So in any one year, it's gonna be different. And so if you can map it over time, that gives you an idea of where those like hot spots tend to be over time. But that changes over time too. And that's why I'm gonna show you this. Um, the, I'll have you focus here on the lower right the H2 herring, see how the, the Valdez Arm and Glacier Islands all lit up in that 2010, 2016 data? If you look here, there's no two, two plus herring, no yellow dots. So the, the driver here, the, the take home message here is, um, we, gotta, we gotta keep doing this monitoring if you want an accurate understanding of what's currently going on. So it supports further uh, doing these aerial surveys further uh, in the future. Bonus material that Scott provided. Uh, he did a little bit of whale counting on the way, um, and he's done this in the last few years. So this is this is the same map, but it shows uh, numbers of whales that they saw. Um, so the orange is uh, is orca whales. You have a minke whale that was kind of way inside the sound, which was surprising. Um, but I know I figured some people would be interested in that, and uh, so that was some kind of bonus information out of this study. All right, key points. Uh, I the uh, the council's money is just improving the understanding of these forage fish biology, and that's a good thing. Um, we all care about the herring fisheries. We care about um, the ecosystem of Prince William Sound. And so by furthering the understanding of herring populations and other forage fish, um, that is um, just building on the science. Um, second, even though there was lots of circles on that chart, that was a low year. So just remember that 2019 was a low year, and we'll see what happens in June this year. We're uh, uh, hopefully fun we are funding that um, another survey this year and um, you know this this data can be uh, Scott's already uploaded it to the Alaska Ocean Observing System so that data is there and I was just talking to Catherine Berg so hopefully we can get that into Irma so that's actually data that's actionable for spill planning and prevent or in response and then um, I think finally you know the geographic uh, distribution changes over time uh, we got to keep doing these surveys so that we have a current understanding. And so I think that supports hopefully uh, your continued support to uh, fund the project and uh, approve this re report. So um, with that, questions?
Rebecca Skinner. Um, thanks, Austin. Can you talk a little bit more about how we would use this data? So I understand that it helps identify, um, I'm going to say, sen sensitive areas. But when you look at the, the map where you have all the dots, there's a lot of dots all over the place. Um, and then the areas where the year one herring went were different than where the, they saw the, the year two herring. So, and you might not be able to fully answer this, but ha so how, how are we to use this data? Are we choosing prioritizing year one over year two, or are they both given equal weight? And then just given how well dispersed the, the fish are, does this kind of lose some of its usefulness because they're they're everywhere and so say if we're trying to um pick a place of refuge because that was referenced um if there's fish everywhere does that mean we don't use any of those places as a place of refuge or kind of how how do we it, this is great data but how do we actually take it and use it and evaluate it and that would help my thinking in continuing to fund this to better understand how are we using it and how useful is it? And is this, or is this a case of just having more data, but it's not really helping us do what we need to do? That's a really good question. And I've had the same question in my mind as well. Um, so my, this is the first year we have that data that's kind of ours to shop around. And so I'm trying to figure out how to deliver it so it is useful and, um, so it was just from my understanding, and I hope if Scott has any ideas too, but um, my hope is that by, so getting just the point data that the, the, this map, just by getting this map into Irma, it gives you a snapshot in June 2019. So if there was a spill this year or in, around that time frame, maybe that would be helpful if we got it to them in a timely manner. So there's that. Um, and then... Um, I want to actually talk to Catherine Berg and other people that are, you know, in a spill drill, the folks like at DEC and DNR, like, is that true? Is this helpful? I don't know. I'm not that expert. So that my job I see is to deliver that to them. And then they can say, is this actually, I mean, I said it's useful for planning and, and spill response, but it might not, they could just say, no, it's not. This is just science stuff that isn't useful to us. So I think I need to run that down before we can make a good assessment of that. Um, but I do also think that this, these maps, which we can't produce on one year's worth of data, but if we funded this for four years, we'd have, we'd have updated maps like this, that instead of the, you know, all the places kind of covered, you would know these hot spots. So maybe you'd prioritize um, GRSs in the um, Glacier Island area versus other spots based on that trend. And that, that's something I haven't even talked to Scott about is, you know, at the end of this project, um, make, make these time series maps. And then that could be an Irma. Um, but I think the concern is always going to be there because the next year that could change. So that's kind of a... Hey, Austin, may I? Yes. Yeah. I think that you're on the right slide, you know, for the RCAC's purpose, knowing where the hot spots are you know any one year things can be a little bit different but there are certain places that uh, the fish are very consistently showing up and so that does help prioritize um, thinking as far as you know these are areas that tend to be a little bit more sensitive because they are prime habitats for the forage fish. And these forage fish are the link between plankton and all your larger animals, birds, fish, and mammals. Um, so I, I think it's getting to these heat maps that has the greatest value for the RCAC. Rebecca. <laughs> I don't see anyone else's card up. Um, so how many years of data do you need to produce a decent heat map? That's first part of the question. And then the second part is 
are we, I mean, are ideally, would you be asking us to be permanently funded or is it more like, well, five years of data will give us a good heat map for, for that five year period? Um, or is this really something to, to be really useful? It would need to be ongoing every year or every two years or whatever. I do not envision that I would come back to the RCAC after creating another heat map. You know, it's the five years that went into the one that you're seeing now gives us a good idea. Trying to get a second five years just to confirm that the spots don't change uh, because that creates uh, issues of itself. It tells you, you know, the value of the heat map to start with, your, your first one. Um, I, you know, but for you, the purposes of the RCAC, I think by the time we have a confirmation as to what the heat map looks like, then we'll have enough information for your purposes. Good. Catherine Berg is online. Did you have a comment? Catherine Berg. Oh, hi. hi, this is Catherine. So, uh, actually, Steve, I mean, Scott did a great job in um, explaining how we would use those hap uh, heat maps. But in addition to, you know, using them in, a dis in an incident, we would use them um, and have used th products like this in the past when we are asked by the Coast Guard to do Tier 1 validations of some of those GRSs that are out there as well as looking at potential places of refuge. So whenever there's some kind of a planning effort that comes up, we do use this type of information. And it's great when we can put something like this into IRMA because that's usually our starting point when we start to pull all the information together and then we reach out to the trust resource agencies to verify and uh, ask if there are any, um, any more new information out there. So, so thanks for that. Thank you. All right, we got to move along, so make it short, lad. Um, no, so I, I see we're, we're looking at basically, a, you know, the forage fish. There, there's so much more, and I'm, I'm just curious, can, can this be correlated while, while they're moving around for other things, you know, the, the, the phytoplankton and all that, or, and if they're moving around, is it to, to larger fish, you know, the salmon, the, um, the whales? Um, so is this a, a piece of information that could be correlated with other studies that the Science Center is doing? Um, I know they have some tagging uh, processes. You know, they're, they had a bays or the mouth of bays and stuff, uh, the entrance. I mean, is this just – I, I see it as a piece of the puzzle, not – the whole puzzle. So on its own, like you're asking, what does it really say or do? So could this be correlated with currents? I mean, fish, I mean, they got to find food. If food ain't there, they're going to move. So, I mean, is there other studies that could help build a, a case for the environment, the whole eco ecology of the sound? Is this another indicator of where it's productive for other things? Yeah, Robert, we, uh, that is, this is just a piece of the puzzle and um, we do have a lot more pieces that we are looking at. So we are using this piece of information to address some of those types of questions that you brought up. You know, why are those spots hot, hot spots? And how does that affect the distribution of other things like birds and mammals? Mm 